By Christmas of 1916, Collins had been released. He was disappointed that on his return to Cork, only two people recognised him as one of the heroes of the Easter Rising. But he went to Dublin, and he was soon placing himself at the centre of political activity. Collins was one of the first Republicans to realise the propaganda value of the new medium of film. When Thomas Ashe, the head of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, died after being forcibly fed in Mountjoy Jail, it was Collins who arranged for the funeral to be filmed. The funeral was in that long tradition of, of Fenian propaganda funerals. Beyond the importance of it as a propaganda event, it was also Collins' debut as a revolutionary after 1916. He stepped forward from the crowd resplendent in his full volunteer's uniform and delivered the oration. It was Collins, the, the blow-in from London, really asserting himself as, as being a cutting-edge uh, revolutionary. Reading about him, he seems just as much, if not more, a businessman and yes. an administrator. And these yes. seem to have been powerful strengths for him. He, he raised, I think, an extraordinary amount of money as he was living on the run, as he was running the War of Independence, as he was financing all the various kind of flying columns around the country, as he was importing guns from Britain, as he was doing about 2,000 other things. Collins treated the revolution very much as a corporate enterprise of which he was the self-appointed managing director and not only managing director of the grand enterprise but also of the ancillary small businesses and that was in essence the secret of his success. He, uh, he professionalized revolution in Ireland. Collins organized not only the financing of a national loan to raise money for the revolution but also its publicizing. Well, Collins has used his uh, his sense of financial rectitude and his moral code. Uh, for example, he stipulated that uh, his movement would have to be temperate. This is one of the breaks he made in the past, no booze. And the other thing, no corruption. Everybody got a receipt. There wasn't a shilling spent amiss. He ran this national loan off the back of a bicycle, and yet everybody got a receipt. A hunted man with a price in his head, cycling round to his uh, safe houses, you know, talking to his assassins here, to his intelligence gatherers there, to his diplomatic friends here, uh, and filling in the, the double entry ledger in the other part. De Valera's wife, he used to cycle out to her every week at the risk of his life and uh, give her, her the money that kept her alive while the husband was away for most of the Anglo-Irish War. Uh, De Valera's eldest son, Vivian, told me how much he used to look forward to the, the visits and playing with this lovely, friendly guy. Um, so he kept the humanity and the rootless efficiency in, in different compartments and the efficiency spilled over to matters financial, which is not a characteristic of revolutionaries generally. I had to... Uh clarify my attitude towards his uh, capacity for violence, you know, because uh, it is quite appalling, you know, when you, when you uh, examine it in depth, you know, I mean, his, uh, his ability to cold-bloodedly pursue that war in the way he did and to change the rules of warfare so that people fight without a uniform, you know, and that they can assassinate people in the street in broad daylight and all that sort of stuff is quite terrifying, you know. And Michael Collins, I think, was one of the first to realize that if you're fighting in small bands and you don't have large armies, that actually the urban scene gives you an enormous advantage, a built-in advantage. So yes, whether we're thinking in terms of conventional warfare or whether we're thinking in terms of urban guerrilla warfare, he was probably its inventor. It's all shadowy, it's all hidden. Who's on the side of Sinn Féin? Who's on the side of the government? Who's laundering the money? Is that little girl over in the corner typing out the report, putting a carbon copy and sending off the copy to Michael Collins so that by the time the, the colonel in the regiment gets it telling him there's a raid tonight, Collins already has a copy. My grandmother, um, whose name before she married was Nancy O'Brien, she was working in the um, telephone system and amazingly um, the British government asked her to decode messages without realizing she was the first cousin of Michael Collins. So of course um, he had an absolutely wonderful inside source of information which he didn't hesitate to use. One does get an impression from reading everything about him of somebody with a tremendous capacity for kindness, you know, and for, for and it, this extraordinary ability to remember the particular detail, the particular kind of detail about everybody's life. You know, somebody who actually 
remembers your name, even though they've only met you 20 years ago. They're doing manners, isn't it? Pardon? They're doing manners. Well, it's also to do with the fact of recognising, you know, looking at, peop at people as human beings, mm -hmm. you know, and as in individual human beings. So the fact that he had that capacity allied to this ability to eliminate human beings from the planet, you know, was, uh, I suppose, the contradictions between those, both of those things, you know, just give, it gives rise to a character of endless kind of complexity and endless that you can be endlessly curious about in a way. I empty the basket and take the linen and then his hand comes over the screen with a half crown in it. You shouldn't take it, Rosie. He's a gentleman, Charlie. Then you're a lady, Rosie. Shut up, you. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Show him what you got from the basket, Rosie. Come on. Bless you, Rosie. We've got them. Collins had discovered how the British system worked. He was smuggled into a barracks, which is now Pierce Barracks, Brunswick Street Barracks, it was in those days. And he sat up all night uh, looking at the ledgers. And there in the mundane columns, he saw in the reports from the remote part of west of Ireland, say, the well-known subversive so-and-so took the train this morning to Dublin and was met at the other end by so-and-so. Now that information is then passed on to political uh, detectives who either arrest the person or they tell the army where to go and get him. So Collins uh, realised that if he started cutting out the political detectives, suddenly there was a vital link on in the chain and by killing about a dozen detectives he could really paralyse the British uh, machine. They, in turn, didn't know who to get after, and they started spending an awful lot of money on intelligence. Uh, to this day, the Irish files are embargoed way into the next century in uh, the public record office in Kew Gardens, partly because they want to conceal what the British did here, but they also want to conceal, out of a decent reticence, the names of prominent Irish people who helped them. You could show me the castle files. I'd never get them out. No? You could get me in. Jesus, you're serious. You think I'm joking? Does anybody know what I look like? Only me. Pretend I'm an informer. Let me in around midnight. I'd never get away with it. I'm sure everything's possible if you wish hard enough. Know who said that? Who did? No. It was him. Peter Pan. Is there a sense in which you felt you had to protect him, to keep his hands clean? He never kills anyone in the film. I don't know whether he did in... Uh... Well, no, that was, that was actually a worry more than anything else, because I thought that would be a reason why the audience wouldn't like him, you know? Because uh, the young guy, Vinnie Byrne, for example, who's going to go out and do that first assassination, you feel terribly, terribly for him, you know? And I, I was terribly worried that uh, an audience would actually loathe Collins, because... He was obviously older than these young men, you know, he was... Uh, He's recruiting these young men to become... these young men to do so, and putting and guns in their hands. And they were Catholics, most of them, so they most thought them, they were putting their religious. immortal soul in danger, which yeah. was another thing. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. These men are more experienced than you ever will. You'll get one chance, and one only. And I don't need to tell you, it's either them or us. We hit them at daybreak. He hated waste, and he thought, just keep the killing to the minimum, shoot the detectives, spare the ordinary people. There is evidence that he did that. But once somebody had to be killed, he was ruthless. He wouldn't take an an a no for an answer. I mean, the people who went out to kill the officer or the spy were more frightened of coming back to Collins with him unshot than they were of what they had to do and risking their lives. The killings by Collins' forces, who are now known as the IRA, led to reprisals by the British forces. Two new forces, the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries, were recruited to combat the violence. They roamed the country, murdering and burning indiscriminately, and appalled even their own officers. As events in Ireland spiralled out of control, a group of crack intelligence agents known as the Cairo Gang were brought in from England. Collins Intelligence Service acquired this photograph of them, numbered for identification. Collins determined to have them all killed on one night, which became known as Bloody Sunday.
Typically, the British reaction was excessive. The Black and Tans went to a hurling match that was being played at Crook Park the following afternoon. They opened fire on the spectators and players at random. Twelve people were killed and sixty were injured. It's difficult to establish exactly what happened, but there's no doubt that Neil Jordan has altered the course of events in his film. A lot of people are going to say Crow Park, where the, uh, the football game is playing, the British did not come in with tanks. Uh, there were these soldiers who climbed ladders and dropped into the park, and so why introduce tanks into Well, it's not, it wasn't a tank, it's an armoured vehicle, you mm. know, it's kind of just a... It looks a bit like a tank, though. Well, it's, it's basically... A pre-tank tank. It's tank. basically a gun with the, you know, yeah. a machine gun with the kind of a protective, you know, uh, kind of uh, saucepan around the top of <laughs> it. But they, I mean, they did drive there in vehicles. You know, they would have a, they would have a protective vehicle like that there. What they did in many ways was kind of worse in a way. They scaled the walls and, you know, locked all all the exits, closed all the exits, and kept the people in there for the best part of a day, and were, you know, firing and picking them off for an entire day. So it would have been the reality would have been probably more terrifying. Yeah. You know, I mean, the reason I did it really was because I wanted the scene to last 30 seconds, really. <laughs> And I also wanted the audience, the spectators in the football pitch, to not quite, to treat the possibility of violence with incredulity at the start. Do you understand? So when the thing breaks through, that little tin pot vehicle looks so ridiculous. The footballer kicks a ball over the top of it and scores a goal, and then the entire football ground bursts into laughter. <laughs> The rhythm of that war that Collins fought was every action by the, uh, the volunteers would give rise to a grossly inflated reaction by the British forces, you know, whereupon Collins would have a wider ground and wider support and then strike in another way. And, and the, the escalation of the conflict, the rhythm of the conflict was one of escalation and I just tried to mirror that in the, uh, in the presentation of in the presentation of that conflict in the film, you know. But that was a reaction to 14 people being killed that morning, having been killed yes, that was. morning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, were all of them British intelligence seeking Collins, or were some no, of them no, no, I mean working, working in administration? I mean, the interesting thing about the actual, about actually Collins' um, activities is that uh, many of the people he had assassinated were Irish, you know. And a large amount of the energy of the battle of the volunteers, and even people like Tom Barry and you know, the leaders of flying columns in Cork and elsewhere, was against Irish people who were working for the British administration, you know, so... I mean, in many ways it was... The War of Independence was not too far from a civil war, you know, or not too far from a war about different concepts of what it was to be Irish. All guerrilla warfare is very diff difficult to combat for the state. In fact, I would say that it's impossible to defeat militarily. I would go that far. That you can only actually, in the end, defeat any form of terrorism by some form of co political compromise. By the time the truce came in uh, June of uh, July of 1921, the IRA were pretty well spun out. Uh, they had fought an exhausting war in the Republic and in the North of Ireland. They were under terrific pressure. Collins knew they'd gone as far as they could. Jesus Christ, make way to hell if you be. Oh, for God's sake, Joe, would you give me one free night to be a human being? We can cover the city for you. Have you heard? No, I haven't heard. What the? The Irish Republic needs to be some time off. Yes, yes. I've been working my... It's over. What's over? What do you mean? It's over. They called it truce. You mean it's finished? The whole damn thing? Yes. You mean we've won? Lloyd George is thrown in the tower? We've brought the British Empire to its knees? Yes. Why the fuck didn't you say so? The British invited Eamon de Valera to London to negotiate a treaty. He slighted Collins, the man who'd won the war, by leaving him out of the delegation, ostensibly on the ground that he didn't want Collins to be photographed. But de Valera soon realised there was a limit to what he could achieve with the British negotiators. He didn't want to be associated with the compromise that he knew was inevitable. <laughs> 